Awesome. And tying this in, so Nisi's talk was about using cloud computing to deliver or enhance the metaverse, right? Like the experience of the metaverse. If you apply the same theory to like 360 degree video, would, uh, what are your thoughts there? Do you feel like there's a higher chance of uh, returns from using game gaze driven delivery? Absolutely, absolutely. So I, I did not touch upon the bandwidth uh, mitigation part in, in my talk, but uh, uh, but this is absolutely uh, uh, useful. Um, so uh, it does require um, eye tracking, right? And which is not something that uh, um, that's unheard of, right? Like uh, in Quest Pro, it's already there. Um, so uh, so yeah, so that's absolutely. So this is uh, uh, something I, I think it's uh, it's actually would happen pretty soon. Um, so uh, uh, and uh, the savings is is huge, and um, um, yeah. Um, and uh, like like what uh, uh, what Yuri mentioned, you know, you know, uh, five six x savings. Um, so yeah, and then depending on the, I mean, the end to end latency, obviously, like thirty and sixty end to end latency is uh, is actually pretty hard to achieve, uh, just given the uh, moving parts of the system, right? There's just so many moving parts. Even even like RTT, obviously, is a moving part, but there are other server side, client side, even eye tracking has latency. So, uh, uh, so I, I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, we should also look at like something like bigger, like 100, 100, over 100, 120 milliseconds to see what savings there are. But it still would be very, very significant savings in terms of bandwidth. And, and like more than just bandwidth, right? It, the savings also include the, the server cost because uh, uh, the server rendering cost, you don't have to even render uh, those pixels, right? You, you render them with uh, with less computers, right? That, that actually saves the, the the GPU cost and actually enables the game to uh, to render the where you are staring at with actually more detail and more uh, more uh, more realistic uh, uh, effects over there. Back to you. Also, yeah, thank you so much uh, for jumping in there nicely. Um, so. This is a question for Anastasis. So in your talk, Anastasis, you shared a little bit about Runway, an ML-powered video editor on the browser. So usually when people edit video, you capture the video first, take it back for processing and editing. On Runway, here's a question. Can real-time object detection and removal be done live? Yeah, so uh, I would say our focus so far has been kind of building an editor where you bring your own content in and then you process it and you perform all these operations to it. But we spend a lot of time as um, uh, kind of optimizing the models around the backend so that we get like interactive frame rates. And in a lot of cases, because we need to process segments of video, we basically get the, the models run inference at faster than real time. So it's definitely the case that we could bring the same models to uh, work in, uh, in a live video context. One nice aspect of it would also be that we can um, we can be a lot more stateful. So one of the principles that I talked to in the talk, uh, that I mentioned in the talk, are we uh, we want to make sure that all the services are stateless, so we can process segments in parallel uh, and make it easier to auto scale based on demand. But if we were talking about the live context, that's uh, less of a concern, and so we can uh, we can even be more uh, have more. Um, uh, have, have the opportunity to use other methods that you that are uh, incorporate the results from the previous frame into the current frame, and that kind of makes it our, our job even easier if we wanted to do uh, inference on uh, on live content. So it's definitely something that the current models that we have can uh, can uh, incorporate. Um, we have less of a um, ability to uh, to do more power processing since we're basically getting the frames live, uh, but the same methods. Can uh, can definitely be utilized for live processing. So I think in this response, I heard you mention as well that the ML models are running on the server. How do you see the trade-offs between running ML models on the client versus server side? Are there some cases where you've considered running inference on the browser itself? Yeah, so that, that's been a big uh, kind of consideration, and we've explored different trade-offs of uh, whether it makes sense to run, uh, for example, for a green screen tool, running uh, a more lightweight segmentation model in the browser. And there is a lot of solutions that basically make uh, libraries that make that e easy, especially by creating kind of portable binaries for the model that can run both server and uh, backend side, uh, server and client side. Um, something that we saw from user feedback is that um, uh, the creative kind of uh, professionals that are using the tool are very much 
uh, attending to details of the results. And so the resolution that we could get to process video on the client side was too limited. Uh, or if we would try to process high resolution, if the latency would be too long. And also we wanted to make sure we support uh, devices kind of across different like um, requirements. So being able to run the same uh, kind of advanced rotoscoping tool on a Chromebook that you can on a, on an M1 laptop was kind of a big uh, consideration for us. And so we ended up right now, everything kind of runs server side, but as uh, web technology is mature even more, uh, and uh, it, it's definitely something that we kind of continue to revisit. Yeah, yeah, I definitely see that, right? Like it's like an ebb and flow, like you want to do as much as you can on the client and push the client to its maximum, but then you also want to do things on the server side so that you can take advantage of even more clients that can't really support the software that you're running. And then the clients get better and so you want to push the clients again. Uh, so that definitely makes sense that you're making the decision and try the different uh, options and make seeing the trade-offs there. Okay, so for this next question, Yuri, we're going back to you. Would the technique to be able to use gaze-driven video delivery be limited to devices with eye tracking or single viewers? Well, in uh, kind of most pure uh, deployment scenario, yes. Uh, but uh, it's entirely possible that if gaze tracking is uh, devices attached, for example, to larger screen and there are several viewers watching the video, it's still possible to use same technology to track multiple uh, uh, viewer locations and their gaze points and then uh, have a multiple regions of interest and if they are not all aligned together. So the, the savings are still there. Uh, a more interesting question is what if, and by the way, lots of devices uh, now have eye tracking, certainly gaming devices are coming with this AR, VR type of devices. So I think it, it will be increasingly a trend for, for many applications. So the metaverse interface devices, that's a, a clear cut scenario. But uh, for uh, a legacy devices, so devices that don't have uh, uh, gaze tracking, uh, for, for those devices, of course, it's a little bit more challenging. What could still be done is, for example, we could use front cameras to track uh, position of the viewer and uh, estimate the proximity of viewer to device. That's possible with even this proximity sensor, this gate, this uh, front cameras. If you do video calls, for example, you have a video stream of a person, so you could look at that video and estimate proximity. So the proximity gives you a uh, sense of uh, what is the acuity limits at this point, and that gives you uh, some other instruments how to limit video encoding to make it efficient. Coincidentally, a few years ago, I wrote a few papers at working at InterDigital and so-called user-aware uh, encoding that practices this. But, but uh, uh, going back to, but that's not gonna give you orders of magnitude gains. Realistically, we will be talking about maybe a factor of two, best case. If you want to get orders of magnitude, we need gaze tracking and we need low device. Awesome. And would you say that this technology or could this technology, can it be built on top of existing low latency stacks such as WebRTC, for example? So uh, it all depends on uh, on the delay. So of course, WebRTC among existing uh, protocols out there today is the closest one to what needs to be used here. It, it uses UDP, potentially reduced retransmission, no retransmission scenarios, it's only the closest among existing stacks that might be useful. But the issue is, is still uh, is the delays of the last link and uh, how close is the each server to the user device. So if uh, that communication is uh, can be reduced to 60 millisecond or uh, around that uh, in orders of magnitude, with a WebRTC as a layer above, then of course, uh, we're talking about a viable scenario. If not, uh, maybe something more vertically tight will be needed with some cross layer arrangements, links to RLC and, and so on. But it's possible. It's certainly a space where I encourage folks to experiment and uh, it's really at the point where it's uh, it's kind of uh, it's time to to try it out. 
Yeah, awesome. So the lower latency, the better. The fastest communication protocol we could get, the highest the gains are gonna be. Um, awesome. Um, so switching things over, Nizi, we're coming to you. So when we're talking about using com cloud compute to enhance the metaverse, we're talking about massive amounts of video flowing from the cloud to devices, massive amounts of data flowing from the devices back to the cloud. How much throughput are we expecting to make this experience possible within the ultra low latency cons constraints? Yeah, so uh, uh, thanks for the question. So. Uh, um... We're actually like depending on the use case, the the uh, the bandwidth requirements are actually quite differs a lot. Uh, for two D uh, cases, uh, usually uh, uh, we're we're usually talking about something you know up to ten meg bits per second. So uh, uh, you know a um, uh, uh, high requirement, but uh, not uh, something unreasonable. Well, given you know, a lot of people now uh, get you know uh, one gig bits uh, uh, one gig at, at home. Uh, right and and uh, um, so yeah and then for for VR use cases for uh, full offloading um, the the second use case that I talked about uh, that's this, this is a, the basically the highest requirement on one and uh, we are basically recommending a minimum of twenty five meg uh, bits per second so that's kind of the the uh, uh, minimum bandwidth we're looking at and uh, obviously if you have more uh, things will become clearer and uh, so uh, so up to in hundred. Mag is uh, something that that we can do. Um, so for for so this is really a challenge a, a challenge in in the developed countries. This is a really a challenge on your last link, and uh, the um, so far we haven't seen any uh, issue in the uh, in the backbones uh, supporting these kind of uh, uh, bandwidth. Um, yeah, and on server side, it's really not an not an issue at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you mentioned offloading, partial offloading. In the case of partial offloading, what are the technologies available to transfer the partially offloaded object from the server to the client? Good question. So uh, there, this is a really a uh, fairly um, still being developed. So there are you know, uh, quite a few uh, different choices uh, in the industry. Uh, and uh, so, you know, so the first thing requirement, right, is actually depth. You need depth information in addition to to the two D uh, uh, RGB information. So some some people call that RGBD, and they uh, a simple way is just to do you know good RGBD compression. Uh, so that's uh, that's kind of the first uh, uh, first uh, uh, option uh, over there. Um, the um, some some problem with that is uh, the characteristics of RGB compression and the depth compression are really different. Um, uh, like for example, for the edge, uh, for for the edge difference, like using the depth would be a really uh, uh, a big jump, right, from from my face to to the background. So these edge uh, need to be maintained uh, really well for for depth. So that's actually a big challenge for for this kind of uh, um, just raw RGBD compression. And then there uh, one more uh, uh, technology used is. Uh, is to convert first convert that into a a mesh like a triangles you know uh, uh, uh stuff and then right and uh, um and depending on your the uh the place right you can uh, optimize the the triangle uh, to to be you know there are less triangles where where you know you don't need them and then there are more triangles in around the edge to to be uh to so that you to satisfy the the resolution requirement over there so that's that's one actually uh, fairly promising uh, technology uh, there as well, uh, and uh, um, and then the um, uh, I think there um, there are some others as well, uh, um, which uh, um, uh, let me think. I, I'll just mention these two. I think these two are the most uh, uh, kind of uh, promising ones. Awesome. Okay, so for this next question, um, this is going back to you, Anastasis. This question is from our chat. Um, they say beat snapping. That sounds pretty cool. Having made a music video before, that would have been useful. One issue with the video was it was shot with very random cameras with very mixed quality. And so the question is: Is it possible to upload the assets and try to do AI super sampling to remaster it? Yeah, totally. And we offer some tools for for that. So there is a few different ways to fix footage. So the footage might be. Well, um, so one thing that we actually released uh, very recently was um, being able to increase the frame rate of the footage. So you can bring a low frame rate video and uh, increase the, the frame rate up to 10x 
Uh, and basically the way those techniques work is you have an ML model that takes two frames and then generates an intermediate frame that's kind of interpolates between the two frames. And you can apply that recursively to generate even more frames than just one between uh, two frames. So that's uh, um, that's one technique that can be used either for increasing the frame rate of an existing video, so keeping duration the same, or for uh, increasing the duration of the video. So just creating like a slow motion effect. Um, we have super sampling in space as well, so that's more uh, upscaling. Uh, and that's something that um, uh, you have techniques for like image-based upscaling where you apply the same technique on every frame or uh, or video uh, upscaling, which kind of considers temporal information and ensures stability. Uh, and then another way that we've seen very often that um, uh, that users want to fix uh, footage that they bring to the platform is with uh, to it's very often shaky. Uh, so want to make sure that you can stabilize the footage. So. Uh, so that there's also a combination there of tracking and in painting uh, works really well there. So you use tracking to basically make sure that uh, to minimize uh, motion in the footage. And then uh, if you do that, then you you end up kind of the like you basically rotate the frame. So to ensure that like uh, the, the subject remains fairly like you, you're not seeing as much movement. And then you want to use in painting to uh, infill all the parts that are uh, uh, that, that you basically now, uh, as you rotated the footage, uh, you you want to uh, infill the missing parts. So there is a few options for that, and 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 very often uh, the, the the final one I wanted to mention is uh, around like color grading. So if you uh, shot footage with a few different cameras, you usually have um, differences in terms of the uh, uh, color profile of in each of those. Uh, shots. So there, we have ways of basically using a reference frame as the uh, to to then ensure that every other uh, piece of video uh, kind of conforms to that uh, to the to the um, kind of color, color composition of that original reference frame. Cool, awesome. That sounds like super useful. And like Runway is the perfect tool for this beat snapping uh, project that our viewer had in mind. Um, I think we have time for one more question or I, that might be it. Okay, so that's it. Um, thank you so much for joining us for Q&A. There's one more session following this uh, and then one more round of Q&A. Stay tuned for the next talks.